I, I happen to be privileged to be a member of Congress, so obviously we have oversight over the Smithsonian. I happen to serve as a member of the Board of Regents for the Smithsonian. I happen to serve as a member of the, board of the, of the Council on the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and I happen to also sit on the board of the, the Smithsonian Latino Center. So I, I wear a number of hats here today on this particular subject. I believe we've entered at some pretty exciting phases for the uh, African American Museum and the prospects for a Latino museum here in Washington, D.C. Uh, if all goes well and my colleagues in Congress continue to fund the project uh, on course by 2015, you should be able to, to bring your family to uh, feel privileged and uh, honor to be able to walk through the doors of a museum that will let us, for the first time, truly understand uh, what it means to be an American from the perspective of the African American community. Uh, and so we're hoping that we can keep that project on course within the Smithsonian and with the help of Congress and all of you in, in making contributions to make that happen. Uh, we have legislation that a number of us have presented that would make the dream of a museum of the American Latino a reality. Uh, to move that forward in the coming years as well, uh, once we are able to establish a source of funding and uh, a venue to make that a reality. And I think most of us understand that the Smithsonian is undertaking a number of efforts to try to make sure that communities ha that have not always been fully represented on the National Mall have that opportunity. And we have obviously panelists who can talk about all of those things. Um, I unfortunately won't be able to stay throughout the entire portion of this presentation because I have a, a hearing I have to return to in a short while. But I do thank you all for letting me be here. And Ray, it's always a great pleasure to be with you uh, when you do your work. The uh, African American Museum was a long time coming. And I start with that because it's been over 100 years that folks were trying to get recognition on the National Mall for Americans who have served this country in so many different ways. In 1929, legislation was actually passed to find a spot and build a building that would recognize African Americans, but Congress would never fund it. And so finally now, with the Smithsonian, we're going to see that become a reality, we hope, as I said, by 2015. In 1993, a somewhat similar effort was undertaken with, with regard to Latinos, when the Smithsonian uh, impaneled a commission to take a look at what the Smithsonian had, had done with regard to Latinos in this country. The report that was issued by that commission was called Willful Neglect. And it outlined how the Smithsonian had done very little, if nothing, to try to help Americans understand the various contributions of Americans of various backgrounds uh, and their contributions to our country. Let me read you just a couple of the quotes from that commission report. The report stated that the Smithsonian Institution almost entirely excludes and ignores the Latino population of the United States. It goes on to say, this lack of inclusion is glaringly obvious in the lack of a single museum facility focusing on Latino or Latino American art, culture, or history. That was in 1993. There was a follow-up report that was done by the Smithsonian to move forward through that report and the work that was done by that commission. Uh, the Smithsonian created the Latino Center here at the Smithsonian. And now the notion of a Latino museum has moved forward. But let me do a real quick pop quiz. So where was the first permanent establishment in what we now consider the United States? Okay, you know, if I should have known some of you would know. I thought <laughs> someone, someone was supposed to shout out Jamestown, and then someone was supposed to say, no, no, Little Rock, and then I was going to, I mean, Plymouth Rock, and Little Rock. Uh, <laughs> I'm Latino, I don't know my, all my history so well, right? Uh, so, not Jamestown, not Plymouth Rock, St. Augustine in Florida, four decades before the other two. Um, name a soldier who served in, a Latino soldier who served in the Revolutionary War. 
Yeah, there were Latinos back in those days. Bernardo del Galvez, maybe you'll recognize the name. There's a town named Galveston, named after the general. Uh, it was as a result of General del Galvez and his forces that came up through the, what, was, uh, what is now Florida that uh, he helped George Washington cover the southern flank of the revolutionaries' uh, fights against, fight against the, uh, the British soldiers. And so uh, we remember him in some regard, Galveston, but we don't remember him or other Latinos in our history books. How many uh, Latinos served in in our military during World War II? About 500,000. World War II, you were too young. You, 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 500,000. Anybody, now you have to be kind of old. Uh, there's a movie called uh, Health, From Hell to Eternity, 1960. You can look it up. Uh, Jeffrey Hunter was a movie star who, who played a, an Italian-American soldier who single-handedly um, captured or convinced to uh, surrender about 1,000 Japanese troops in the Battle of Saipei in 1944. Uh, it was a good movie. I remember watching it. It made me feel very proud. The thing is... Uh, the young man who did that, because it's a true story, wasn't Italian-American, he was Mexican-American, and his name was Guy Gabaldon. But in 1960, uh, it was easier to sell a movie about an Italian-American, uh, American hero. Um, Tom Brokaw, everybody's heard of Tom Brokaw, right? Respected American, a friend, I consider him a friend. He wrote a great book, The Greatest Generation. The greatest Generation. Big, thick book about that World War II generation. Not a single mention of Guy Gabaldon or any of the 500,000 uh, American soldiers of Latino descent who helped keep this country free. Uh, nothing at all about any of those folks. Uh, there was a great documentary not long ago made about the war called The War by Ken Burns. Anybody heard of Ken Burns? Phenomenal producer, great historian. His PBS documentary, 14 and a half hour documentary, was getting ready to air. Many of us found out that throughout the 14 and a half hours, he was going to have not a single mention of any Latinos in America during uh, the whole fight, that whole generation. And so we, we chatted with him and PBS, and fortunately they, they added a few things here and there at the beginning or at the end, but they were unwilling to make any changes to the original version of, of the production. But we got included, because we fought to get included. There are over 50 million Latinos in this country. If you include Puerto Rico, it goes up to about 54 million. Um, and the only place you'll find mention, real mention, permanent mention of Latinos is perhaps if you go visit the Vietnam War Memorial, where you'll see several thousand Latino surnames. It, it's all about visibility and inclusion. It's about making sure that when your children and my children walk the mall and have a chance to really get to know what it means to be an American, that we really do get to know what it means to be an American. And so if my kids can really understand it, chances are some child from some place far away from America who's coming here for the first time will also get, to get a chance to really get to know what it's meant to be an American. And so I think it's time for us to have these kinds of conversations. I think it's fantastic of the Smithsonian to do this. And I applaud the Smithsonian for moving forward. We can have this conversation. As the Commission on the Latino uh, Museum said, the purpose of, of this work on a Latino Museum is to illuminate the American story for all. That's at the end what Smithsonian is about. I hope that that's what we do. I thank you. Next, we're joined by Philip Kennicott, critic for the Washington Post. Um, thanks. Uh, it's a kick for me to be on stage where my uh, illustrious ancestor, Robert Kennicott, actually got two mentions this morning. Um, unfortunately, I didn't inherit any of his scientific brilliance, which is why I'm a journalist. Um, I, I'm a critic. My title is, is art and architecture critic, but I have a slightly wider portfolio than that. 
architecture often bleeds into urban design, and art is a big enough subject that you do end up taking up larger cultural issues. And so it's really a matter of which hat I'm wearing that determines many of my reactions to some of the questions I think we'll be considering this afternoon. As somebody who writes about art, uh, I firmly believe in the more the merrier. Um, a wild diversification of museums in Washington just gives me more material, gives me more to think about. I love that idea. But as somebody who writes about art, you are keenly aware of the resilience of the master narratives of history, these sort of hydra heads of myths and half-truths that just keep coming back, no matter how often uh, other museums or curators interested in correcting the narrative may do excellent work. There's a powerful um, uh, livelihood to them. As somebody who writes about architecture, um, I'm often thinking about whether or not we actually need a building to accomplish an agenda. Um, I'm thinking about how buildings uh, prioritize and create hierarchies of space, how they represent what's supposed to be inside them. And the more I spend time in Washington and look around, especially on the mall at the buildings here, the more I realize how fundamental to what a museum can accomplish um, is the way it's basically designed. Um, this particular museum, um, I think is no secret, has had a problem somewhat finding audiences in the first few years. But every time I come down here, I sit out in that garden, and I think that that garden is the thing, in many ways, that's going to be the, you know, one of the greatest assets to this, to this museum, because it's an incredibly inviting space, and because it gives you a way to be on the mall that's very different than the traditional way. So architecture is fundamental to the success of these buildings. As someone who writes about urban design, um, I'm looking at this highly contested public space of the mall. Um, wondering about where buildings should go. Should they be here? Should they be off the mall? Should they even be in Washington? Are there places that, um, if, we, if we go down a path to a diversification of, of ethnically specific museums, um, do we want to be geographically diverse in where those things are located? And so I confront those questions as well. And then finally, uh, as someone who writes generally about culture, you deal with the philosophical issues. Uh, the word balkanization has been brought up today, and that's oftentimes seen as the, um, the negative outcome of the diversification of museums. Um, I think that in 15 or 20 years, we may not think about ethnic identity in the same way that we think about it today that as we build museums that are dedicated to particular groups, we also have to remember that we're becoming an amazingly hybridic society in the way we identify. And so that are the buildings and the museums that we create today, are they gonna be adaptable enough to essentially carry that narrative of identity forward um, into places that we can't even anticipate yet? In general, I think most of the problems facing us when we consider ethnic museums or culturally specific museums are practical ones. Um, I'm not particularly worried about the balkanization of culture because I think that this master narrative of American history, we're still in the infancy of trying to correct that. Um, and I'm not that worried about how we define ourselves in terms of identity in 20 years because museums are basically adaptable institutions. And so long as they keep that in the kind of forefront of their thinking, then they will adapt as identity adapts. For me, the questions are primarily practical ones. Do we have the resources to do um, a number of new museums and do them well? Do we have the audience for these museums to sustain them over time? Do we have the right people thinking about what they're going to do in these museums? Are they going to be about scholarship and preservation and education? Or are they gonna be about something else? Are they gonna be museums about something or for somebody? Um, and I think that those are questions you solve in the design of exhibitions. They're questions you solve in the way you do scholarship. And they're questions that are solved in the way you issue the invitation to people um, to come in. And I think that if we go down the path of more museums and more culturally specific museums, if they're created and sustained in ways that surprise us and delight us and provoke us, then they will be successful and they will find the audiences and we'll be happy we made them. Next, we're joined by David Penny, Associate Director for Museum Scholarship at the National Museum of the American Indian. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, just to begin, I'd like to acknowledge just a couple of things I heard this morning. Can you hear me? 
I did not acknowledge Dr. Price um, in his um, mention of the Newark Museum. Uh, I spent 30 years at the Detroit Institute of Arts, and I know very well and share with him um, the enthusiasm for the ability of museums to, um, in the service of civic and cultural revitalization. Uh, museums can be very powerful things. I also want to acknowledge my uh, colleague, Dr. Thomas, um, uh, and his comments about the transformational impact of the National Museum of American Indian, my institution now, in the field of anthropology and also museum practice. Uh, I've, after four decades of working in museums on uh, Native American topics, I can testify to the enormous changes that have taken place in my career between then and now. And the National Museum of American Indian really is created sort of a, a gold standard for community uh, consultation and collaboration. Uh, in the museum world. Enormous impact there. I also want to acknowledge a comment I heard this morning uh, from a colleague um, from the American Museum of American History, um, and, and the parallel between the balkanization, perhaps, of, of um, culture in museums, and also the balkanization of disciplines, the discipline of history, anthropology, technology, and art. Um, and, I, and I say this coming from a standpoint that um, I believe as, as culture, as a category, as in a culture museum, um, culture is, is composed of all those things and many things. Um, culture is history, culture is in the terms of experience, culture is technology, culture is science, politics, economics, law, race, land, religion, and on and on. Culture is nothing in and of itself but a formless vessel, a, a shorthand concept, uh, an invented word that we use to contain all those different things. Uh, most simply put, culture consists of learned behavior, learned knowledge. Um, and uh, we learn our culture uh, as we learn about the culture of others. And uh, that learning and that knowledge becomes part of our culture too. Culture is in, uh, knowledge as insiders, knowledge as outsiders, and, and everything in between. Um, so museums, therefore, don't hold up a mirror to culture. Mir uh, museums are instruments of culture. Instruments are powerful engines for creating culture. Uh, and they're particularly well suited uh, for, to generate knowledge, um, uh, knowledge in a broad sense, uh, because of their great potential for influence. Where it's where scholarship meets a broader public. Uh, it's uh, in ways that are very different from the the environment of the seminar, the environment of the classroom, the media, or literature. Uh, it, it, somebody earlier this morning used the notion of sanctuary or sort of safe place, but it really is where, in a sense, the rubber hits the road in the sense that that the general public can come and, 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 and um, uh, expand their sense of culture by virtue of, of knowledge. But um, museums actually sort of convey knowledge through, uh, mostly, mostly through this um, technology we know as, a, as an exhibition. Uh, we, we call this in the business uh, an informal, immersive learning environment. Uh, it's where the participants, you know, those visitors who come, they exercise a great deal of choice about how they will experience the museum, what lessons they take from it, um, and now our, our practice of creating and designing these immersive environments, um, it benefits from decades of res uh, visitor research. We know that we really have to improve our skills at effective storytelling within the context of museums. We've got to start where visitors are. Um, and so in, in storytelling, um, the issues of where you start where you stop, uh, what you include, what you don't include, um, these are not uh, objective decisions, um, not meaning that they're not, no less truthful, but they are political. They're always political uh, in the sense of how you convey, how you assemble uh, facts, how you assemble human experience into a, into a story that makes sense in the context of an exhibition. So it was, the, it was really the mission of the National Museum of the American Indian to change the conversation about American Indians. Uh, and our inaugural exhibitions here I think we're, we're incredibly effective in, in restoring uh, a voice to Native communities um, and its, its ability to, to, uh, uh, for outreach to communities, for training of Native professionals in this business. Uh, their, their work with collection sharing and with the uh, mutual development of tribal museums. And, and it's a very, that, that was the, the first sort of phase of activity here and we have a lot to be proud of. But actually it's a very exciting time right now at the National Museum of the American Indian because we're thinking about how we can have greater impact in this larger sort of larger mission about changing that conversation. And we're beginning to plan new galleries, new experiences for our visitors uh, that we, we hope will open as early as 2015 or so. 
In doing so, we're taking on the, this, this that was mentioned earlier this morning, um, this notion of uh, our, our position as a national museum and engaging in these kind of national narratives. Um, and uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Thomas, talked a great deal about how American Indians and the history have been very firmly linked to anthropology, where there's been a conflation, um, we can see, between our understanding of the evolution of stories about the evolution of humanity, the evolution of our nation, um, and the evolution of culture where American Indians have been cast into a role. A role as a foundation culture, but a culture that then somehow leaves the stage. It was interesting listening to the reenactment of Secretary Henry, um, and we, we reflect here often about from the standpoint of the 19th century, given the kind of policies and so on that, uh, that American Indians uh, experienced and endured, um, it's fair to say that it was impossible from the standpoint of the 19th century to, for many of the policymakers, for Secretary Henry and others, to imagine a future of 2012 where the United States would be, would be um, home for 550 plus sovereign Indian nations. Um, all the policies led in the other direction, this notion of disappearance, uh, that the Indians wouldn't survive. Um, and so in, in planning for collecting and the gathering of knowledge, it really was sort of planning over a wake or a funeral. Um, so our, our whole, uh, unfortunately, however, those, those kinds of stories that are being told about American Indians as this foundational um, character in the American myth, American story, uh, they continue in a variety of different ways. Um, our curators, our, my colleagues here, have, have posed a question for our, our new installations of um, the kind of paradox that, in fact, Indians are all around us in the sense of automobiles, helicopters, uh, sports teams, uh, code names for military operations. Um, yet, um, Indians, as, uh, in terms of uh, their experience, are, are, are invisible. Um, and how do we sort of deal with this paradox? Our, our new installations, we hope to confront these kinds of paradoxes front on. Um, we're going to um, examine where those uh, sort of mythologies and stories about American Indians that so much inform the popular media, where they come from, why they're wrong, why they're incorrect, uh, and what, uh, uh, more accurately, what is foundational about um, uh, 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 American Indian experience in terms of the history of this culture, we, uh, American culture. We feel that American Indian, the American Indian history is, is American history. It's every person's history uh, who comes in, uh, into, the, into the building. Um, that uh, it would be impossible to imagine, for example, the, the rise of the Atlantic economies uh, and the um, uh, European modernism without um, uh, the, this event of the coming together of this, uh, the two hemispheres in the past. Um, so we'll, we'll deal with this, those sorts of issues of this hemisphere apart in a series of galleries we'll call ancestors. Um, and in, 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 in our galleries uh, after 2015, where we, um, we're, we're calling sort of in a shorthand way right now Americans, we want to excavate beneath these kind of national myths that include issues like Thanksgiving and Pocahontas, Custer's Last Stand as sort of entry points. We sort of meet visitors where they are. Um, but then um, really examine uh, and, and maybe more of the surprising stories, the stories of resistance and heroism, such as the Pueblo Revolt, King Philip's War, um, or the, the, the facts of the brutality of the uh, California Gold Rush, which, and other narratives and other uh, stories are, are celebrated in a very different way. And then in present tense, uh, we really want to deal with the issues of the political and social struggle, struggles that resulted um, in the creation, this kind of settlement, uh, very unique uh, in world history today, of, um, the, of modern sovereignty as it exists in the United States. Um, and the impact of treaties and these contemporary relations, and, and point out the fact that this is the unfinished business. Uh, there's still a lot to be said in terms of these stories. Um, so uh, we're, 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 we're um, very um, say enthusiastic and um, hopeful about the ability of the, this museum and national museums, broadly speaking, uh, to, uh, to change the conversation, to enrich our sense of culture in the broadest sense. And uh, we're, of course, uh, enthusiastic and uh, very expect about the, our, uh, the, the efforts of our colleagues here at the Smithsonian and waiting expectantly for uh, uh, our newest uh, 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 addition to the uh, uh, mall to open our Museum of African American History and Culture. Thank you. Next up is Lonnie Bunch, Director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Good afternoon, everyone. A couple years ago, I received a letter that began, Dear Left Wing Historian. <laughs> And even I knew that wasn't going to be a good letter. <laughs> the author went on to say, what happened to the Smithsonian I loved? 
It was a place that once celebrated America. It was a place that let me feel proud that I was an American. And now you're gonna create a museum that's going to dredge up painful memories. You're gonna create a museum that talks about things that are better left unsaid. He went on to say, after all, America's greatest strength is its ability to forget. <laughs> he then went on to say how left-wing historians like me shouldn't be hired, they should be fired, they shouldn't build this museum. He threw me off though at the end when he said, best wishes for your continued success. <laughs> The point, however, is that in many ways, when you think about ethnically specific or racially specific museums, what they really are, are places that are clarion calls to remember. More than anything else, their job is to make sure we don't forget, and that in many ways, we remember as a nation, not just what we want, but what we need. And so in many ways, the desire to have a fuller understanding of the American experience is at the heart of what these institutions are. But I would like to sort of talk a little bit about sort of what I think the challenges are and where these institutions need to go. And I think about that from my own career. In 1983, I was a young historian hired by the state of California to work at the California African American Museum. It was the first and at that time the only museum in America that was state funded that was wrestling with issues of race and ethnicity. And if anybody remembers 1983 in LA, it was a heady time. The state of California had actually money. Um, that was revolutionary. Um, but it was also a time that the Olympics were coming. And suddenly culture was important. Museums were being spruced up. New ideas were being embraced. People were coming together to wrestle with the history of this country. And for the California African American Museum, oh, what a time it was. It was a time to build a new building. And I remember thinking, how am I gonna raise the $3 million it took to build a building? Oh, if all I had to do, well, that's another story. <laughs> but it also allowed us to add to the canon. Suddenly it was important to help people understand the role of African Americans in Los Angeles or Oakland or in the Inland Empire. Suddenly it was important to help people realize this amazing array of talent, of artists like Betty Saar or photographers like Carrie Mae Weems or sculptors like Richard Hunt. In some ways, it helped the museum learn how to reach out to the state, how not just to be something for Southern California, but how to develop relationships in Mendocino and all throughout, Southern, all throughout California. But the point is that while that was important and even innovative in 1984, I would argue that today, museums that explore race and ethnicity must do much, much more. That it's not enough simply to add to the canon. In some ways, these institutions must answer the question, how are they of value today? How does an institution demonstrate its worth? In essence, how do museums who care about race and ethnicity go beyond Me Too history? history that simply places people of color within the historical narrative. After all, it was once important to show that there was early black involvement in Los Angeles or that African-American photographers existed. But is that good enough today? Or do these institutions, by the work they do, make their communities better? Being of a community being part of a community isn't enough today. I think, since we're talking about the Newark Museum, as John Cotton Dana, the great founder of the Newark Museum, once wrote, museums must recognize what the community needs and adjust their mission, their vision to those needs. In essence, I would suggest that museums that wrestle with race and ethnicity don't need to try to become community centers. Rather, what they need to become 
is centers of their community, providing things that help the community survive and do what it needs to do. But I would also argue that museums today, if they want to wrestle with this, have a great opportunity, and that is to help the public embrace ambiguity. Museums, as best we try, still often give simple answers to complex questions. And ethically specific museums are often held captive by creating narratives that suggest a linear path to progress, that want not to fall into the sense of victimization, but sometimes by doing that, eliminate some of the complexity, some of the challenges. And yet, the histories of these communities, the cultures of these communities, are nothing if not ripe with ambiguity if not full of shades of gray, if not full of complexity and pain and unresolved issues. It is essential, it seems to me, that these museums, and by extension, all museums, find ways to help our audiences become more comfortable with complexity and ambiguity. Thirdly, I would argue that ethically specific museums must build on their traditions. In many ways, these were the most innovative institutions in America. Remember, these are the institutions that made a commitment to education and audience long before other museums cared about that. These are the institutions that recognized the need to collect oral testimonies and preserve collections that weren't considered high art or worthy of these museums. And maybe more importantly, these institutions always understood something that other museums are now wrestling with, that culture, that museums are political. In essence, I would argue most importantly, what is the future of these institutions is that they must reclaim their Americanness. They must demonstrate that while they are of a particular culture, and that that culture is important to a particular community, they must also show that their history, that their presence, casts a greater shadow that goes beyond their communities. In some way, all of this shapes what the, what, I was going to say the California African American Museum, see where I am, um, where am I doing the National Museum of African American History and Culture, um, what that is. Because in some ways, as we try to create this, the vision for this museum really reflects those issues. First of all, it is a museum that has to help Americans to remember. It has to help Americans remember the people they think they know, the kings, the sojourner troops, in new ways. It has to help Americans embrace amazing stories of people they don't know. The, un the enslaved woman who got up every morning and fed her kid and made sure the field didn't strip her of her humanity or the family that left Mississippi for the south side of Chicago in 1913, or people like my grandmother who did wash and washed other people's floors to make sure her children or grandchildren wouldn't have to. But in some ways, this museum has to do something that is hard for a place like the Smithsonian. It has to help America confront its tortured racial past. This has to be the place that makes you cry or at least ponder over slavery over segregation. This has to be the place that makes you realize that we haven't often lived up to our stated ideals. But it also has to be a place that allows you to find the joy that is in this community. You've got to be able to tap your toes to Duke Ellington or Aretha Franklin or Cecilia Cruz or somebody from the hip hop world, I have no idea who it is. Um, <laughs> but somebody on my staff is 12, they will know. <laughs> But in some ways, if the museum only helps people to remember, then I would argue it shouldn't be a national museum. In some ways, a national museum needs to take African American culture and clearly use it as a lens to explore what it means to be an American. Not what it means for black people to be Americans, but what does African American culture mean and how has it shaped profoundly the American experience? I mean, think about this. Often when I go up on the hill and I get the chance to see Congressman Becerra, there are often other members of Congress who ask questions of me that say, well, what are the core values of this museum? Well, when I say core American values like resiliency, spirituality, optimism, 
And I say, often, the roots of these come from within this African-American community. In some ways, the, the story is simple. This has to be a museum that takes African-American culture and lets everybody realize, regardless of race, regardless of whether they're from the North or the South, regardless of whether their family has been here 200 years or came here 20 days ago, they are shaped in profound ways by the African-American experience. And then the third piece that is so crucial to this is the notion that there are hundreds of institutions around this country that have explored this subject for decades. And it's foolish for us to act like they're not there. So in many ways, the key of this museum has to be a place of collaboration a place that is a beacon that takes advantage of this fact that people will come to the Smithsonian but not go other places. So we want to be a beacon that draws you to Washington and then pushes you back to local museums. So in essence, yep, I got it. I got the mic, I'm gone. But in essence, the bottom line is pretty simple. The National Museum of African American History and Culture has to be a place that on the one hand helps us to remember, but its goal is simple. While it will build a signature green building, while it will have wonderful artifacts and great exhibitions, the goal of the museum is to make America better. So in many ways, the challenge for us all is to recognize that we have an opportunity with these kinds of institutions to make America better. Thank you very much. And finally, we're joined by Conrad Eng, director of the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Program. Well, um, aloha, if I may use a greeting from my home state. I'm honored to have the opportunity to join colleagues who are as passionate about the, the important role that museums play in our life as uh, I am. Uh, thank you to the many people who helped realize today's event, with special thanks to uh, Elizabeth, who is the proverbial glue. Uh, that held this project together. Uh, finally, uh, let me express my gratitude to the National Museum of, of the American Indian for the privilege to speak. While this building is a public space, I also acknowledge that it is sacred ground. Almost 14 years ago to this day, the Honorable Norman Mineta submitted to then Secretary of the Smithsonian, Michael Heyman, the final report of the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American National Advisory Group. This was a special task force, uh, force created by Smithsonian Provost, Provost Dennis O'Connor. The document was, an of the, was the outcome of a two-year study uh, by a group of prominent uh, representatives from academia, the corporate sector, philanthropy, museums, and included Senator Daniel Inouye. The report stated that, quote, historical and contemporary significance of our presence in the United States is largely absent from the Smithsonian's collections, research, exhibitions, and current planning. This is 1998. The commitment to, uh, to Asian Pacific Americans by the Smithsonian, they wrote, would improve the Smithsonian's standing as the agent of America's rich heritage and, quote, improve the public's appreciation of the crucial roles that Asian Pacific Americans have played in the United, in the United States and simultaneously empower Asian Pacific American communities in their sense of inclusion. Now, I'm always struck by these opening arguments. Since the advisor group claimed that for Asian Pacific American communities, the Smithsonian Institution was, at least in the late 1990s, an ethnic and culturally specific American museum vis-a-vis -vis its lack of inclusivity, and more importantly, this absence was affecting our civic health. Since the publication of that report, the Asian population in the U.S. has grown faster than any other race group in the United States, increasing by over 43% between 2000 and, uh, 2010, and composed of some 19 Asian and Pacific Islands groups who number over 16 million people and constitute 10% or more of the population in many U.S. cities. Yet the Smithsonian's resource priorities often request support for what we already have, as opposed to asking for support for what we need, which are often the objectives of mission-critical initiatives. In this scenario, Asian Pacific American history, art, and culture, which is already generally absent from what we have, will continue to be absent. The story is, of course, similar to the stories behind the creation of the National Museum of the American Indian, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and the proposal for the National Museum of the American Latino. But let me suggest something different, maybe even novel. Ethnic and culturally specific American museums are vehicles for sustaining relevance. They're sustaining the relevance of museums by not only 
being relevant to a populace that they purport to reflect, but they can have the force of relevance specific to the, digi to the digital age. The current shift towards digital platforms and technologies as the site for knowledge and learning has meant that museums in their collections-based uh, physical object ethos are lagging behind a digital model of engagement. But the challenge in the digital age, I suggest, is not the adoption of technologies, platforms, and softwares that keeps pace with their changes, but how may we adopt a progressive role for museums to play? Over the past year, both the New York Times and the Washington Post reported that minority communities, and specifically Asian Americans, are using digital media te and technologies as a means of circumventing the traditional media industries and markets that have historically excluded them. While there are few bankable Asian American stars in film and television, and stereotypes continue to obscure the understanding of Asian American life or prevent our inclusion in discussions about American identity, a generation of Asian Americans is flourishing on YouTube and other so social media platforms, and according to reports by the Pew Research Center's Internet and American Life Project, English-speaking Asian Americans are internet users at higher rates than the national average. Now, my claim is this. Because of the historical exclusion from our institutions and industries of culture, minority subjects and communities, like Asian Pacific Americans, are producing online cultures and partnerships that are as compelling and as important as life in the, in the offline world. In fact, online space is the only space that they can claim as their own. Online life is where history is taking place, it's where ethnic identities are being expressed, and it is as meaningful as the material objects collected to create a museum. Now when the Smithsonian commits itself to digitization, when museums commit themselves to digitization, it ought not to limit its activities to improving collections management, as the collections themselves could be more diverse, or limit activities to amplifying public engagement and incorporating the latest invention, but it should devote resource, resources to how we may treat digital media as the vehicle for culture and heritage. To, par to paraphrase the work of a media studies scholar and, and colleague of mine, Lisa Nakamura, rather than bringing minority critiques to bear after the shouting is over, uh, she said, those with expertise in the fields of race and ethnicity can bring our experiences to bear on digital media while it is still in formation. To spin a, fra uh, to spin a phrase raised this morning, the paradigm of, the, of a master's house and what that is, and the master's tools and what they are, have shifted. Let me return to the topic of this panel. What is the role of ethnic and culturally specific American museums? Uh, last week, a um, woman at the uh, Asian American Studies Conference expressed to me that she did not view the Smithsonian as being relevant to her. There were other venues for the preservation and, importantly, appreciation of her Asian American heritage. As I was listening to her story, I thought of uh, another colleague of mine, uh, Chris Liu. He's the, at the White House, uh, is the White House Cabinet Secretary. And he pondered these scenarios during a recent keynote address. Would America have a different understanding of immigration, migration, and citizenship, or the debates around the DREAM Act, if we knew more about the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which occurred 130 years ago to this year? Would America have a different understanding of the balance between freedom and security and the feelings of South Asian, Muslim, or Arab, or Arab Americans in a post-9-11 world if we knew more about Executive Order 9066, which led to the internment of Japanese American citizens and immigrants, which occurred 70 years ago to this year? Would America have a different understanding of travesties like Trayvon Martin if we knew more about the death of Vincent Chin, which occurred 30 years ago to this year? Museums are the souls of our nation, and they can be our conscience. Ethnic and culturally specific American museums allow us to rethink the sources and sites of the official story, including our own origin stories, and, widen, and they can widen the range of symbolic material used in the construction of American identity and history. In this sense, the goal is not simply to preserve examples of American exceptionalism, that is, those proud and unique parts of the official story, or suggest that Asian Americans exist as the model minority for the digital age. The goal is to consider how digital media brings into being potent forms of heritage and collaboration, and to bring to bear Asian Pacific American experiences of power and history. Now, I would be remiss if I did not say that our stories do not exist in isolation that Asian Pacific Americans should and do see ourselves as part of the experience of American Indians, African Americans, Latinos, and others, 
and we should be part of their museum plans too. Asian Pacific American online life can be a tool for research, a method of preservation of public good, um, and a way to reflect on the relevance of museums in the quest for knowledge and their role in supporting our civic health in the digital age. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, you've given us a lot to think about and put a lot there on the table. From several of the speakers, we heard about the notion of exclusion, that one of the tasks that can be taken on by culturally specific museums is to answer historic exclusion from a master narrative of history or to fill in those gaps in an incomplete or previously erased historical record. But to the extent that these museums end up becoming like ethnic history classes taught in high schools and universities where uh, if you go to a high school in Tucson or Phoenix and you duck your head in to look at the Mexican American history class and it's 25 Mexicans, even in a school that's majority Anglo. Uh, let's talk a little bit about audience and how function meets audience. That place that made you feel proud to be an American that Lonnie, your letter writer, talked about, don't you have to, as a museum designer, as someone who's conceptualizing a museum, don't you have to take that seriously? Isn't that what a lot of the people who come to the mall come for? And should they be warned in advance if you've decided to make a museum that doesn't do that? Um, I think that I didn't say I wouldn't do that. I mean, I think the most important thing is that for the first three years of our existence, all we did was get to know what the public knew, what they wanted, what they feared, and what they cared about. So that in essence, the goal of this museum is to craft environments and moments that allow publics to take maybe their fears or their concerns and recognize this is their story as well. And so what has been most wonderful has been based on all the kind of scientific sampling we've done. Almost 70% of all white Americans say this is their story too or they're interested in hearing this as well. So the fears that somehow this will ultimately become a black place for black people is not a fear I worry about. It's a, it's a concern that we think about, but we realize the way you tell different stories so that yes, there will be those stories that will be hard, but there'll also be stories that'll make a father smile as he's telling his daughter about Jackie Robinson. So we'll look at ways to find that right balance and to find that tension. Congressman, I'm glad you brought up Guy Gabaldon. His, his story is even cooler than a lot of people realize because he was adopted not officially but in the way that people used to adopt people before social workers and paperwork was involved. And he lived with a Japanese family through his entire teens. And the way he got thousands of Japanese on Saipan to surrender to him was to tell them in Japanese that just over the hill there were 10,000 U.S. Marines who were going to come kill them. And he talked them all into surrendering night after night without firing a shot. Uh, a Mexican kid from Boyle Heights who spoke Japanese, uh, played by Jeffrey Hunter who played Jesus uh, in King of Kings. Uh, and de-Mexicanized for the, for the movies. It's, it's a great story, but I'm not sure how we, how we get that into a museum in a consumable fashion. It's true, there has been a lot of history that's been written out of history. How can museums function? Physical places filled with physical artifacts and various kinds of media, how can they function as those gap Fillers. And I'd like, I'd like everybody to weigh in on, on that because that's a big concern from, from what was said across the panel. Ray, perhaps the best way I can answer that is by just saying that to me a museum is not a place where you see dead people and uh, things of the past. To me it's a living creature that lets me interact with it and better understand who I am. When I go to the Museum of American History, uh, when I go to the 
Air and Space Museum, I've never flown a plane, but I could certainly see myself in the cockpit of one of those vehicles. I could certainly see myself wearing that hat, that top hat that Abraham Lincoln wore. And I hope that that's what every American who walks through whatever museum we have will feel when they get to step into that place, that prison cell that Martin Luther King was in when he wrote that wonderful letter or uh, experience what it was like to be on a, uh, a fast uh, as Cesar Chavez was trying to fight for the rights of farm workers and experience that. That's, we're, we're in there to live. And uh, maybe I can close it by saying this, and I'm going to have to run after this and ask Eduardo Diaz from the Latino Center to come in, in my place. But I remember 2008, a lot of folks in this country, including the Latino community, are saying, you know, if Barack Obama wins the nomination, Latinos aren't going to vote for a black man. You know, there's this black-brown tension going on. And, you know, there, there aren't a lot of Latinos who are going to want to vote for this guy. At the end of the day, Barack Obama got more votes from the Latino community than Bill Clinton did. And uh, Bill Clinton got more than I think any president I can remember from the Latino community. Why? Because Latinos lived Barack Obama's story. In Barack Obama, Latinos saw themselves. And certainly I know mothers and fathers saw their children in Barack Obama. And so the beauty of America is that we're not going in to see dead people or learn about some far away, long in the history artifact. We're there to learn about ourselves because we really are them and they really are us. And so Barack Obama is as much me as he is someone who considers himself African-American. And I think that's the beauty of these museums is they will continue to tell that story, but in a living, growing way. And that's why I hope we do this sooner than later because my kids are gonna get old soon and uh, I want them to be able to go soon. Thank you. Um, you know, your earlier question, Ray, about, you know, how you get people to sort of go in and, and, and break down the resistance to, to learning about stuff that may make them uncomfortable, I think that we, we shouldn't, on a panel like this, underestimate that problem. You know, I think we're, there's a lot of uh, right-minded thinking on this panel, but that is a real problem. And a lot of people, when they bring their kids to Washington, D.C., um, I think they feel like they don't want to go into a building where it's going to be depressing or, or confrontational or difficult. So how do you get around that? Um, the reason I stressed in my remarks the importance of objects is I think that if you present the museum as a collection of things first, rather than as a collection of moral lessons, you're much more likely to get people to come in the door. And then the moral lessons, if they're, uh, if they're to be taught, emerge from the things themselves. Um, I was thinking of a uh, PBS program that I've seen a couple episodes of called History Detectives. Um, it probably makes academic historians wince, but it actually does a really good job of breaking down the sort of resistance that you need to get people to listen to stories they wouldn't think of. It begins with objects, and then there's a study of what this thing is, how was it used, where did it come from, and through that process, you learn a lot of stuff about Chinese American history, about Latino American history. Um, but the, the narrative isn't one that begins with a moral lesson and then finds the evidence for it. It's one in which the, the moral lesson really becomes sort of obvious, but, um, but not, uh, not put forth in such a way that you're inclined to sort of get your back up and resist it. Um, and I think the more museums think in those terms, the more likely they are to, to get people to kind of make that first entry. And then once they've done that, I think, you know, 80% of the battle is over. Well, I'm glad you brought up history detectives because the only other mention of PBS was of Latino exclusion from the war <laughs> by Ken Burns. So at least this, this evens things up a, a slight bit. You know, people are ready for a downer and it's one of the most crowded museums in Washington. People flock to the Holocaust Museum, but it's a bad story about bad things that other people did to other people. And I'm wondering if that's centrally, importantly different from the stories of other people on this continent that also include great crimes and great sins. Of course, one of the great challenges is that 
when we first started creating the African American Museum, people said, well, there was a core that said, make it the Holocaust Museum. But as you've rightly framed it, one of the great strengths of the Holocaust Museum is the bad guys aren't American. And so what is really a challenge is to find out how do you balance the notion of the kind of resiliencies, the notions of the sort of perfectibility of the republic with the realities of some of the stories that aren't pleasant, that are difficult. But I think the bottom line for us is that what people are telling us is no one wants to go to a museum where you're depressed every time you turn the corner. But what people want to do is they want to understand their history. They want to understand who they are. They want to understand complexity. And the benefit of the Smithsonian is people will give you that benefit of the doubt they may not give at other institutions because they're coming to do the Smithsonian. So that one of the challenges is not to get them in the door, unlike some places, but to make sure once they're in that you're able to tell a diversity of stories that engage as well as prod. If you have some questions, please uh, head to the mics. Go ahead. I think it's Im important that we try to expand the notion of the museum beyond the, no uh, the idea of objects in a building. I think, we're, I think we're at the stage where more people come to the Smithsonian online uh, than they do through its doors. And what's changing about that is our relationship to the museum itself and its role in our life and the way in which we use it and feel some part of ownership to it. So I think there should be investments, as I noted earlier, not just leveraging what we got, but trying to create a form of engagement that is, in some ways, culturally specific and ethnic specific, because that's where some, of the, uh, you know, some communities are preserving their history. Because they've already lost their faith, or they feel that uh, in the institutions, or they feel that it's too much of a steep climb to get back in. So I, I just want to note that we shouldn't exclusively think about space or objects. While that's always going to be part of the equation, I think we need to be innovative about being online and moving beyond our, our reach. I, I just wanted to add that it seems to me that too often in these, uh, this kind of conversation that um, we, we separate or sort of distinguish between stories that are stories of celebration versus stories of critique. Um, on the other hand, what, what our visitors tell us, and, and I'm you know, very interested to hear the research that um, uh, uh, Dr. Bunch did, as, and the research that also I'm familiar with, what people are looking for are stories that are meaningful to them, that relate to their lives. Um, and um, I, you know, although and I, I, I very much um, appreciate the opportunities that you know, the web offers and uh, online experiences, but uh, in addition to that, um, there is a unique um, and powerful capacity that objects have as these kind of time machines to transport people back to a particular time and place by virtue of contact or relationship to the object. The difficulty, of course, is that museums face is that how, how do you make those objects speak in a way that people can understand them? Uh, and that's where museum craft and storytelling comes into play. Um, and we know when we do it right. Um, it's not about making people feel bad. It's not making them feel, you know, and to a certain degree, it's making them feel more human. Um, and uh, I think within the, within the kinds of narratives that we're talking about uh, with all ranges of different Americans, um, no matter their racial or ethnic background, there are stories there that are profound human stories that can be told in museum spaces um, that, uh, as, as, as has been said before, really very much, very much contribute to, to um, a sense of being a human being, but also, and, and dare I say, being an American as well. I just wanted to um, to add something to the to the discussion that also plays off a little bit of what uh, of what David just said about objects and what uh, I think I understand Conrad saying about experience. I'm Eduardo Diaz for the Latino Center, and I have a t difficult job. I have to fill rather commodious shoes that uh, Congressman Becerra has left me to fill, but I'll do the best I can. I I want to tell share with you that the the Center and the Smithsonian um, is are preparing. Uh, to receive this museum, uh, hopefully the National Museum of the American Latino, and when it gets here, uh, to have a reasonable plan that deals with issues of collection, program exhibitions, and audience, uh, and audience development. So I just wanted to share that uh, with you. This is really very much a collaborative par uh, uh, piece. Of, it's, it's a very collaborative um, process, I should say. Um, why? Because the Latino community is everybody. <laughs> uh, we are black, we're Asian, we're indigenous, 
We're European. We're Asian. Uh, every religious community possible. Uh, gay, lesbian. We are, we are all of this, and we have, as, as a result, we have a, an obligation, I think, to focus on all of that diversity within this diversity, and happy to do so. It's funny, yesterday we had a meeting uh, that was, we had folks from Conrad's program, we had folks from the National Portrait Gallery, we had folks from the National Museum of African American History and Culture, John Franklin who's joined us in Kinshasa and other colleagues, folks from the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage, and of course the Latino Center to talk about a program about Joe Batan. Joe Batan was a Afro-Filipino, raised in East Harlem, and the king of Latin soul. <laughs> That's who our community is. And um, it was a wonderful experience, and I hope we have a wonderful program when we celebrate in October as part of a national, you know, that we, we do with a month that has to do with the, the contributions of Filipino Americans. That's what I'm talking about. We're all in this. We all have a piece of this story about who Joe Batan was. And that's the way we're sort of approaching it. In terms of the objects, this museum has 12,000 plus objects of Central American pre-Columbian derivation. As we look at, as archaeologists, unfortunately, and anthropologists often have done, they get to Mesoamerica, talk about the Aztecs and the Mayas, and whoop, next thing you know, they're in, with the Incas. And what about all the stuff in the middle? Well, what about all that stuff in the middle? These weren't just some sort of Mayan knockoffs all of a sudden that were just, you know, living in, in Central America and did not have a, 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 an integral society to integral civilization. So we are working with objects to tell a new story and deal with a community that has been terribly underrepresented, including by us, including by us. And so we have a tremendous challenge here. And fortunately, we have a wonderful opportunity as well. And um, I'm pleased to see that the Smithsonian, at least within the Latino framework, is thinking about this thinking about this collaboratively, thinking about this in a multicultural way. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Eduardo. And I should um, remind all guests that uh, for all my prodding and what might sound like skepticism, I'm always available to narrate the films that are cycling <laughs> in, the, uh, in the Smithsonian galleries. Tell us, tell us who you are and where you're from. Hi, uh, my name is Gretchen Jennings. I worked for a number of years at the Smithsonian, and I now edit a, a museum journal. Um, I think that one of the biggest areas of inclusion and non-inclusion non that's going to be coming up is really between the people in general and the authority of museums, um, more in line with what Mr. Ning is talking about, that in fact, um, the, the talk today is of participatory museums, of shared museum authority, and I think the, the Native American Museum was probably ahead of its time in, in bringing in uh, the voices of the people and actually having them help to curate exhibits. On the other hand, uh, the Native American Museum has been criticized, and I, I don't think this is news to them, and I think rightly so, about some of the museology involved in putting the objects together. In other words, some of the galleries are dark, cramped, in, in the presentation, there perhaps needed to be a little more coaching from the professional museum side. So I have a question, I guess, for some of the newer museums, uh, Lonnie's Museum and, and the Hispanic Museum and so forth. What are the structures that you are putting in place to allow for the people to actually uh, contribute in a substantive way to the collections and to the creation of exhibitions, number one. And number two, um, what have you learned from the Native American Museum experience about how to coach that and, and craft that so that the, um, the exhibitions are good exhibitions and, and engaging to people? So I'd be interested in, in what any of the speakers have to say about this kind of tension between having more public participation um, substantive contribution and then the museum helping to modify that to make it um, accessible, uh, engaging, and what an exhibition should be. You might talk about oh, your collective sure. okay. In many ways, we've learned a lot from a lot of places about the role of the public about the role of community in shaping its own history. 
And we've done an awful lot. We've put a lot of structures in place where one of the major things we've been doing is been collecting oral histories through StoryCorps and places like that and using those oral histories to shape some of the choices of stories we tell and using those oral histories as ways, as strongly interpretive tools. But I think I want to be really clear. To me, the best word in a museum is tension. Tension is nothing to run away from. And I'm trying to find a tension between giving the audience what it wants and giving the audience what it needs. So I feel very strongly that there has to be a strong curatorial voice that is no longer the curator is autocrat, but is part of that tension with the audience. So that for us, it really is about making sure that we're taking advantage of the best technologies to let people shape their experience in the museum, to add new content to the stories that we want to tell based on some of the conversations we've had with the public already. But it's really important to me to make sure that we don't give up completely the fact that scholarship has to always be the engine of what we do. So again, for me, it's the tension between what the public wants and what the public needs. And if we can find that right tension, then I think we'll be doing exactly what we need to do as an institution. Let me just also add, I think, uh, that it's important for us, I think, from a Latino perspective, to, to do programming leading up to exhibitions or leading up to the establishment of, of a museum as a way, of formally, of informing um, the process. The exhibition that we will open in March of 13 of the Central American Ceramics at this museum is already underway. The programming for it has already started. We're already engaging at the local level the, the Central American community here in this area. Why? They are the largest Latino population in this, in this uh, region, D.C., Virginia, and Maryland. So it, we would be stupid to go forward with a, with a project not consulting with them. Uh, this whole consultative uh, process uh, that uh, Dr. Thomas referred to today is very, very important for us. It's in the same way that it was important for the National Museum of the, Ameri uh, of the American uh, Indian. Lonnie drew a, a distinction earlier in his remarks about the center of the community versus a community center. I think, however you want to look at that, I think the Latino effort here at the Smithsonian has to lean towards a community center model. I don't know that the strict museum, capital M, uh, format um, is, is, going to, is going to work for our community. We are not a museum-going crowd. Is that that's just the reality. We have to pay attention to the dynamics of how our, of our community uh, engages with art and culture. Not, and, not, and I'm not saying that to the exclusion of not caring about how others are going to engage. This museum, the Future Museum, cannot be necessarily by, for, about, and only for Latinos. It has to be a, a, an opportunity like this museum that we're in today to, to, to educate on, on the culture, the civilizations, the history, and the contributions of, of, of Native Americans. This museum is also called the National Museum of the American Indian. America as in continent, not as in country. And I think we need to always remember that's why we're doing this exhibition in March of 2013. So for me, community center model, however you want to view that through whatever optic uh, that, that, where that leads you, but it has to also be really um, about, about that, about the experience and engaging community from the very beginning as a way of informing the success of the project. Let me, yes. let me add uh, that oh, ahead, in my on. conversations with you know, Lonnie and, and uh, Ido, uh, that this is a, a unique opportunity, as I mentioned, where we can bring in different voices while things are still in formation. And one of the things that, in our conversations that we've had uh, professionally, is how is it that you know, the communities which we see a shared history and, and exists between Latinos, Asian Americans, African Americans, Asian Americans, um, et cetera, how can that be there at the beginning? How can we seed those kinds of partnerships? And I think that's something in which, with the building of the American Indian, it was focused on a, a real concept of that sense of sovereignty and writing their own story. I think that what we can learn from that and moving into these other, muse other museums that are being built is how can we bring in those partnerships at the beginning? And that's not just consultation, that actually means devoting resources from curatorial or scholarship. Uh, I take the point about the power of objects, but you need to hire someone who understands it in a way that's complete, as opposed to just singular. And so it's really important that we would have these conversations in the inception of these museums. John Franklin, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. 
What I wanted to say earlier was that indeed these museums do not exist in isolation and collaboration is very important. And I wanted to uh, ask Eduardo and Conrad to talk about what Eduardo already raised, this program on Joe Baton. But I also wanted Lonnie to share with you the two collaborations we've had, one with American Indian and the current with Monticello. I didn't hear the last part of what you said, Monticello. John. And the current part, uh, partnership with Monticello. The visible on Monticello. Well, I think that what is clear to me is that I didn't want to run a museum project. I wanted to run a museum. So the notion was to basically say that the museum existed from the day we started. And part of that existence allowed us to test ideas, to develop partnerships. So that's why we opened a gallery in the Museum of American History. So to be able to give not only scholars an opportunity to do their work rather than say work a decade and then you'll finally get to see your work, but it really allows us to learn from our audiences. And so we've really made collaboration as a core value of the museum. So, Part of what I know from being at the Smithsonian so many years, and this is my third time back, that in essence, the Smithsonian has an amazing opportunity. It has an opportunity to give people different portals into what it means to be an American. You can go through the Air and Space Museum, or the Smithsonian American Art Museum, or the Indian Museum, or the African American Museum, and ultimately, we're all giving you a comparable story, but through very different lenses. But what it also means to do that is that we have to do something that we don't do all that often in the Smithsonian, which is collaborate with each other. And so I think for us to begin to work with the Indian Museum on the Indivisible Show, looking at blacks and Indians, to work with the Latino Center, that for us, this is all about not only improving what the Museum of African American History and Culture can do, but also facilitating so that the Smithsonian is made better by our presence. So ultimately, this is less about what it means simply for one museum and more about how it helps the Smithsonian be the kind of 21st century museum that people will still find meaning, uh, people will still find important, people will still be able to shape as we move into the future. Yes, Miss. Hi, I'm Tiffany. I'm actually um, the director for DC APA Film Festival in our 13th year. And um, the Smithsonian has always meant a great deal to me. I actually have home videos of when I was two, three years old walking in the Natural History Museum. So I was wondering, although we're talking about culturally specific museums right now, how do each of these very American stories, Latino American, Asian American, you know, African American, how can we bring that all together into the American History Museum, which already exists? which I know every third grader, fourth grader, fifth grader takes busload trips into, instead of sending them to like six different museums that each have a specifically curated gallery about you know, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Why don't we have something that is all American in the American History Museum? That's a really important question. The challenge is that it's impossible to do that. Um, that in some ways, for many years, I was in charge of all the curators at the Museum of American History. And the goal was to make sure that you tell as many of these stories as you can. <clears throat> there are real practical reasons why it's difficult to do that. One is that it, I'd love to have $90 million when I was there and redo the whole museum. But I think the other issue is that the notion of the complexity of the past has grown over the last 40 years because of scholarship. That it's no longer simple to simply say, we can, we can peg the Latino story in one gallery. Or if we explore X, that's solved, that, that, we've checked that off. In essence, what I hope will happen is through these collaborations, there will never be one place where you learn Asian American material, or you learn African American material, but rather there is the opportunity for the conversations within the Smithsonian so that every museum will play aspects of that out. But every museum cannot, the shoulders are not broad enough to carry it to the level that maybe you can do in a new Latino museum. So for us, it's really the goal is trying to find a balance. 
to make sure wherever you go, you're touched by the rich diversity of America, but recognizing that you can go other places and to go very deeply. So if you look at the Museum of American History and you see that there are two helicopters in that exhibit talking about Vietnam, but if you really want to know about helicopters, you better go to Air and Space Museum, and there's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, that's the strength of the Smithsonian. I was just going to add that um, part of it, I think, has to do with, I think, what Lonnie's talking about and about what uh, Philip knows a lot about, and that's architecture. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it, the, the building is, has, has issues. And, and I also want to return to, the, but, you know, I don't know if we can fix those. Or, those are big fixes, very expensive fixes. But it really actually ties into something that uh, Dr. Price said this morning, that was the whole dichotomy between temple and forum. Um, you know, that museum tends to look like and act like a temple when it really needs to be a forum. If we want to really engage, I think the kind of dynamic engagement that Dr. Price was talking about this morning tends towards the latter, should be the latter. How do we create a space, a welcoming space, that allows for that interaction? Now, from a Latino perspective, I will tell you that we're thankful at this point, and I see that uh, Richard Kern, I think, has taken off, but we're going to be hopefully seeding new curatorial support uh, that focus on Latino issues, content, around the institution, not just at, we don't have a Latino museum, so we, and it's not gonna stay with us. It's, we're going to be placing Latino curators pan-institutionally so that we can, in a way, integrate. For me, it's almost more important, it's almost more important to be about integration than necessarily that it is to be about diversity, per se, because diversity is still the separateness. The integration is a way in which we can weave those Latino stories into this telling of American art. You know, Chicano artists are American artists. You know, Guy Cabaldon was an American hero. These, you know, these are American stories, and that's, this is a theme that's been repeated you know, quite a few times this, 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 this day. I think that's what it's about. To the extent that we can get there, I think it will make for a much more interesting experience. Uh, quick final comments from, uh, from Philip or David. Uh, I'd just like to respond to the last question. I, I think um, one of the more interesting things that's going to happen if we go down a path where we have more ethnically or culturally specific museums is what role does the so-called big house play? You know, what's going to happen there? How will its mission change? Um, will it be a kind of aggregator of narratives from other museums? Um, will it try to do a kind of um, slightly tweaked master narrative that takes into account the stuff that's been learned in the other places? Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. I can imagine, say, in 15 years, say there are four or five new museums, either Smithsonian or not, um, that are looking at history from particular um, ethnic perspectives or, or culturally specific perspectives. Um, it'd be really interesting to take an event and have each of those museums tell that event um, in an exhibition that might actually all have the same name um, and then let people actually move from the Americanist Museum to the Latino American Museum or the African American Museum of History and Culture and and hear the same story you know is, is it going to be like four different symphonies you know four different orchestras playing the same symphony or is it going to be something radically different that you don't even recognize the same event in these four different presentations I think we'll learn a lot from that experience I think I saw that movie <laughs> <laughs> no I, I think it's an issue of granularity um, that in the 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 the, the difficulty, the, the difficult task that the Amer Museum of American History has um, is, is its, its scope. Um, and I, what I hear in that question is a fear that given the fact that we've created these other uh, culturally focused or ethnically uh, centered museums, will that become then the Museum of White History here at the Smithsonian? Um, and some would argue, well, that's what it was. Um, <laughs> But I, I think the, the, the I, I take the point uh, uh, that we, we just heard is that that the, the scholarship here at the Smithsonian is engaging in that master narrative, um, and it's engaging it from a number of different directions. Um, and in terms of how we're going to portray that narrative, and, and pieces here, pieces there, uh, different perspectives, um, that will have an impact on the the, the larger narrative uh, of Amer of American history that's addressed over there, and it already has, and, and will continue to have. Um, so uh, in the sense that, that um, um, I always like to think that, that sort of life is short, but museums are long. Uh, we like to see change uh, happen very quickly. Taking the longer view, just in the, in, the, in the context of my career, I see a tremendous amount of change in the way that those narratives are being positioned within those museums charged with developing those master narratives. So I'm very encouraged uh, for what will happen over there 
over time or what's happening there right now. I'd like to just add my, uh, my thoughts on that. I mean, it's a challenge that uh, certainly all the Smithsonian uh, museums face in terms of engaging a changing demographic, regardless if it's a helicopter or it's uh, something else like a heritage and the like, although those aren't exclusive or, uh, of each other. Um, but I will s say this, that I know that if there aren't meaningful efforts to reflect the, demo the demography that is projected to change and is going to change, uh, say, for example, the inclusion and recognition of Asian Americans and their notion and understanding of history and art and culture, uh, we're going to see people wanting that space, right? They're going, we're going to see the communities, like Asian American communities, asking for a space and asking, where are we? Now, if we, don't, if we don't address that, if we don't consider our, our notion of museum, museumology as beyond objects in a building, if we don't change both of those cultures, we're going to be continuing this discussion. Um, and I, I can sense that. I can see that. Uh, from the community and obviously from your con uh, question and the organization that you're affiliated with. It's something that both you and I know. Please thank Eduardo Diaz, Philip Kennicott, David Penny, Lonnie Bunch, and Conrad Eng.